Okay, we're going to do a quick run through achondroplasia and morchial. So in achondroplasia, we know these are the problems. Um, I just wanted to comment about hydrocephalus. Um, when I first started in this business, probably every single child, not quite every single one, but most were shunted for hydrocephalus, and we rarely put in shunts today. Most of these kids have, have um, communicating hydrocephalus and do not need to be shunted. Um, I wanted to go through the uh, genetic abnormalities and the current therapy. So these are the five types of disorders that are caused by an FGFR3 uh, receptor mutation. And it's in decreasing severity, so th th thanatophorax die, and the hypochondroplasia is the most mild. So it's a 4P16 um, gene abnormality that was identified in the 80s. Uh, and the pathway is very interesting. So um, if, if I'm an FGFR3 receptor, I have my arms waving in the extracellular world. <laughs> my waist is a, is a chondrocyte cell wall. And my feet are the tyrosine kinase um, in the cell um, uh, cytoplasm. So when, an, when a fibroblast growth, growth factor, when a fibroblast growth factor wanders by, I grab it and my feet start moving and the downstream effect is reduced endochondral bone formation. This is an activating mutation, so these receptors are stay activated and aren't cleared as fast as normal receptors. It's interesting that there is a human syndrome that causes gigantism when this receptor is deactivated. So here's the impact. So this is an Acon mouse, an average mouse, and you can see the width of the proliferative zone in the affected and unaffected mouse. So most of us, our eyes glaze over when we see these things, but this is very, very important in achondroplasia. So here's the FGFR3 receptor. It's activated, downstream impact is reduced endochondral bone growth. But most systems in biology have feedback. And so this is the feedback, CNP, C-naturetic peptide. And it works through an NPR receptor to up-regulate bone uh, growth. So you can imagine they're being turned on and off all the time. So why don't we take CNP and give it to people and turn their growth back on? And so that's the basis of the current therapies. The problem is the cartilage has very poor blood supply and it's difficult to get these molecules into the chondrocytes. So this is what several companies have done. So here, Biomarin has created a CNP with a longer half-life. It's a daily injection. I'll get to it in a second. Ascendus is right behind them, but still working on animal models with a longer acting CNP, so you can get an injection once a week. And then Theracon is working on soluble complexes that mop up these molecules and prevent the downstream effect. So here's two Acon mice. This one was treated with CNP or had its CNP turned on. Here the CNP was knocked out. So you can see the effect of CNP. So this is the basis of Biomarin's um, current um, um, uh, um, um, trials and the 901 trial is an observational trial, and so the child with achondroplasia is brought in, their growth is monitored for six months. Then they can go in to one of these trials. This is the only active one right now. It's five to 18 years of age. It's a double blind randomized placebo-controlled trial over one year, and they get injections daily. This is just starting up, and this is the trial that makes sense for me. So what's the problem in achondroplasia? The problem that affects them all and tortures them for their life is spinal stenosis. So if there's a way to make their spinal canal grow, the problem is that happens in the first four to six months of life. So you've got to get the drug to them early. 
Um, so this is the current trial. They have 79 randomized people in there. Um, they're they're going to recruit 110 around the world. This is the mix, 41 in the US, United Kingdom, Spain, and Australia. And um, this trial uh, will be closed soon, I would think. So this is the top of the problem for achondroplasia. So the foramen magnum stenosis, and it does all these things, slows growth, slows development, or can kill them uh, in early life. So here's the problem. Average stature, foramen magnum, and acon frame, foramen magnum. We all think that the growth up here is not endochondral, but actually the entire base of the skull is endochondral bone formation, not intramembranous as we're all taught in the occiput. And so the impact is a small frame and magnum, which leads to stenosis. And the, the current recommendations are to image early in life, but most of us who do this all the time rely on, on physical exam and sleep studies to monitor this. So here's an example of a child, three years old, not walking, a year later after a decompression, up walking. And so um, it can be um, dramatic in its, uh, in its effect. Thoric lumbar kyphosis, this is seen early on in life in achondroplasia. Um, this is data from my, my um, organization, and you can see the dramatic improvement in the thoric lumbar kyphosis. Uh, this is important because it can become worse. Um, Dr. Tolo had these indications, greater than age five, greater than 40 degrees with significant wedging, but I actually don't operate on these kids early in life. I, I wait until they're symptomatic with spinal stenosis or discomfort. So here's an example of an odd child I took care of who got worse from 10 to 16 years of age. He had significant spinal stenosis. You can see it's stiff. They develop this lordosis in the uh, thoracic spine. And um, I did a, um, an, a posterior approach, a VCR, and then instrumentation infusion with a good result. So spinal stenosis, 25% symptomatic by 15 years and 80% by the sixth decade. It is um, a significant impact on function and quality of life. Um, the treatment, when it's symptomatic, is decompression. If there is any sagittal alignment, you need to instrument, instrument and fuse. This is a complex procedure. This dura is always under pressure, so it's paper thin, it tears, it's hard to repair, it's a tough operation. Um, it can be seen all the way through, from the head to the bottom. So here's a young man who had symptomatic spinal stenosis affecting his arm and lower extremity function and bowel and bladder. And so he required a decompression and fusion at both levels. I've only had to do this a few times, but it does occur occasionally. Genuverum, um, Peter's already talked about, very, very common. And um, I think we have a better tool today to manage it. This is something that we've um, uh, wrote about recently. Um, these kids have a very high incidence of discoid lateral menisci. So Javier is gonna have them in there taking out these menisci. So um, they become very symptomatic and it's lateral joint pain. So they've got genuverum, but they've also got discoid lateral menisci. And so you've got to very carefully evaluate these kids. And this is just an example. Extended limb lengthening. Um, something I did earlier in my career, I don't do it now. And, and the reason I don't do it now is I think it's better done in a system that's very focused in it. And I think very few of these kids need it. Um, but the, the, I take care of a lot of short statured families um, uh, and the parents are successful people. And not, there isn't one person in North America that with a short statute parent who's undergone limb lengthening. And I think that's very, very telling. You know, it can be done. Um, this is one of Dror's patients that, um, uh, that he did recently, um, almost 40 centimeters of lengthening, but repeated procedures over many, many, many years. And if the child really wants it, I think it's 
perfectly reasonable, but it should be a decision, a careful decision. Um, I think this is the most important thing that we can do from a functional perspective for these people. Their biggest problem is getting to their perineum. And um, I think humoral lengthening uh, is a dramatic um, uh, improvement in their function. Um, so we'll go on to MPS. This is a large group of disorders um, caused by deficient enzymes and accumulation of GAG substrate, which affects the body in, a, in multiple areas, the so-called dysostosis multiplex. So this is an old buddy of mine, um, Eddie from Wisconsin. Um, he's had it all. Cervical spine instability, thoracolumbar kyphosis, um, he um, had a back surgery early on in life. Um, he presented it too with a thoracolumbar kyphosis and a wedged vertebra with a flame-shaped extension in the front. So what is that? That is MPS every single time, and it doesn't always progress, and it's rarely symptomatic. And yet this child at age two had an attempt to repair this and be fused. And it's been a disaster for this young man, the sequelae that has, uh, that has um, uh, gone on from there. So this is due to a mutation, Morchial syndrome is due to a mutation in the N-acetyl galactose amine 6 sulfate sulfatase. And you won't be allowed out of the room for coffee unless you can say that. <laughs> um, and it's really simple. Keratin sulfate is processed all the time in our bodies. And if the enzyme to break down the keratin sulfate is broken, you accumulate keratin sulfate in your bones, in your organs, and you have problems. So um, Vimazim is, um, is a enzyme that was developed by Biomarin um, and um, has been used for a number of years now. It is out of the trial, but this was the, the trial that they use is a randomized, double-blind, placebo study. And this was, these were the outcomes. And they had better endurance, little more growth, and um, uh, overall, these people feel better when they take this enzyme. It's a weekly um, infusion. But the problem is there is no impact on the skeletal manifestations. I, I've had, I have kids who have had enzyme for five and six years, um, but no, no impact on the skeleton. So what's coming um, is a guy who works at my place. I hired him from uh, St. Louis. He was the one who identified the uh, gene mutation. He has developed a, a recombinant um, uh, vector to express deficient Gallons enzyme. And this is probably going to be a one injection treatment and, um, and uh, it will hopefully have an effect on the bones. So he will be entering a trial sometime in the next year or two. So Morchial syndrome. This was one of my buddies tattooed Morchial syndrome and then read it, stabilized neck because he didn't want to be found on the highway somewhere um, and be roughly moved around. But uh, these people have a very high incidence of upper cervical instability and um, a prophylactic fusion has been suggested. But here you can see I've taken care of several people uh, who are adults with Morchio that do not have any instability. So here was the child, six years old. Every time she'd fall on the ground, she couldn't move and someone had to pick her up, then she slowly regained her function. And um, she had been transplanted um, many, many years ago. And, but look at the instability at C12. And look at her flex X awake MRI. Look at the spinal cord. Just being crushed in flexion and extension, a little room, and significant myelomalacia. And then the, the keratin sulfate accumulation uh, behind the dens, and she needed a decompression infusion. The problem with these kids is an anesthetic problem. It's probably the most important thing we can do for them. When we put them asleep to do their ear tubes or whatever, you have to understand the issues with this ear airway. Uh, this is an example of uh, something that we described just recently. Um, look at this trachea. 
right hand turn and compressed almost to nothing and then compression down here. So when the anesthesiologist goes to put that tube in, it doesn't go in. And um, there have been multiple deaths in Morchio syndrome related to anesthesia. So we, our cardiac group has now done seven tracheal resections successfully um, with good results. One of the problems with the cervical spine is about 30%. We found 30% in our group develop instability below an intact fusion, okay? And so we have to extend the fusion and uh, control the instability. There also is stenosis, not only up here, but at the cervical thoracic junction, which this young man had, and also down with the kyphosis. So this young man had a decompression. Um, the problem with the thoracolumbar kyphosis is it can be, it can look quite significant, but it can be completely asymptomatic and non-progressive. So most of the time, it doesn't need to be treated. Um, but here's a boy that does need to be treated that I just saw recently, significant kyphosis, which is now resulting in um, cord compression, and you can see that up in here with some myelomalacia. And so when I get back, this is something I have to, I have to fix. Lower extremities, natural history is progressive genuvalgum and um, progressive hip dysplasia, and most of these people need a wheelchair by the time they hit 15 to 20 years of age. Um, so this is the, um, the typical progression in the, in the hips. So they start with mild dysplasia, and then this progresses, and they migrate up and out, and this sort of um, camel-shaped uh, femoral head articulating with the edge of the acetabulum is very typical in the older group. Um, so this is an example of the reconstruction I'm doing now. Um, I actually, ch I've chosen to use shelves, and we can talk about that later, and realign, and realign the proximal femurs, use eight plates distally and at the ankle, and um, you can um, do an excellent job of realigning these people and improving their function. Uh, oh, listen to that. So click it again. So this is a 20-year-old Morchio walking with straight legs. That is absolutely unheard of. Um, you know, most of these people are not walking these severe Morchios with severe genuvalgum. Um, we've reviewed our study and, and, and um, we've, we've studied the kids we've done. We've done 56 hips and had very good uh, functional and radiographic results. These people usually develop osteoarthritis and um, uh, the challenges here are many. Um, articular, periarticular deformity, capsule and soft tissue contracture, poor bone quality, small canals. We've often had to use custom components. High complication rate. This example of a girl I took care of, here she is at 16, was realigned, very, very bad hips. Custom component with these little small brooches. Um, you can see that we had a crack in the femur here. We had to graft the acetabuli on both sides. And this is one of the advantages of early reconstruction. It's easier to do total hips. And I just wanted one, one last comment. Um, when you have a dwarf, any dwarf, with kyphosis, having that child wake up with paraplegia when you're doing a lower extremity surgery is becoming very, very common. I know probably 20, 25 kids around the world. And they were put to sleep for hip reconstruction and woke up paralyzed, usually related to a kyphosis and um, cord compression. So be very, very careful. I actually monitor all these kids now. Thank you.